So let's examine for a moment or two, and you may, you know, you may say it's as simple as semantics, but let's consider for a moment, what do we mean? What, what meaning are we sharing? What meaning are we expressing? What are we ourselves experiencing when we say the word life? What is life? Not unlike, by the way, the way we would ask the question, what is Buddha? Or what is enlightenment? Uh, <clears throat> and there are many who would begin to analyze the physics of life, or the biology of life, or the chemistry of life. But you notice I keep saying of life. Because no matter how in-depth your knowledge of chemistry, or biology, or physics, or cosmology, or psychology, all our seemingly points of reference to what life is. <clears throat> it's contained in that word, is. What is it? It's all physicalness. All sciences, whether it's biological, medical, or physical, physics, Chemistry, combinatory, my, my favorite made-up word. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know what's going on with my throat here. But we'll try to lubricate it. Quite simply, is life the stuff? Right, we know that every single... Let's just call them particles, because that's the parlance. But you know how I, uncomfortable I am with the word particle, because that particle in, it, it is like a hermetic thing. But the truth of particles, the deeper you get into the sciences, the more a particle is just a, a lasso, a, a rope, a bubble we put around we force it to be a thing, is actually states of energy. Right? Down to a photon or less. Just energy behaving in an innumerable amount of ways. Innumerable because it can accrue around itself and make slightly different forms of energies and behaviors between those energies and suddenly we have an atom. So we can point at it and go, thing, it's just a condition with tendencies. That's all it is. A condition with tendencies. Think about that. Think about the chair I'm sitting on, you're sitting on, the shoes you're wearing, the teeth in your mouth. Everything 
is just energies with certain tendencies and conditions. That's much more accurate to the fact, as Buddhism says, that nothing is static. Everything is constantly changing. The rate of change may seem very slow to our samsaric minds, but it, everything is changing as a blistering pace of moment, 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 moment. Can't say it fast enough. How long is a moment? It's a question that comes up all the time. What do you mean a moment? How long is a moment? Well, a moment is the moment it takes for energy to manifest. How long does that take? Gosh, can't measure it. Can't measure it. <clears throat> the limits of our minds to measure is the speed of light. Because the speed of light has nothing to do with light. It has everything to do with the mechanism, the perceptive tools that we have to measure. Measure what, you might ask? A distance or a time or, well, those are the same thing. Space time, time space. It's actually a measure of our experience. And that's a limit of our experience. So you start talking about what is life, and there's a hard border between things and how they are thinging. <clears throat> Thing, thing, a thong. I'm sorry. <laughs> Versus, what was the key word I just said? Experience. Experience is the way we measure. Experience is the way we perceive. Experience is the primary tool by which we analyze, inform, conceptualize, <clears throat> make static, make permanent, make owned, make disowned. Experience is our measurement tool of the engine of desire, the engine of being. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the question? What is life? Life is being. But now you have to be careful. How do you hear that word being? What do you, what does it mean to be? Because the implication, again, with humanity and human language and our thingifying, to be is to be, 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 is an hard stop. To be is to be static, to be the thing but we shouldn't think of the word be we shouldn't we need to adjust our mind that to be is a process that's constantly changing moment 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 that being which is obviously a verb is to be to be is not static to be is not my my name. To be is not my sex. It's not my clothes. It's it's this transference of energy from moment to moment to moment to moment to moment. That's life. That flow, that current, 
that momentum, that's life. And if I can experience in my samsaric brain, informed by an enlightened mind, then I cease to evaluate my be and the being of that chair and the being of this building and the as things that exist. And this goes back to Buddhism. Exist, non-exist, not not exist. This argument in the mind that wants to make everything this is here as a static thing because I need to own it. Do you see what that is? That's identification. Identification is the root cause of all our discomforts, anxieties, stress. Because it's not a real event. The perception of formations of those potentials, the potentials of chair, the potentials of Bob, Alice, Ted, the potentials of this building manifesting in each moment. It's a wondrous thing happening. It serves no purpose to discuss what happened because that no longer is. This whole time-space thing and our relentless wanting to hang on to it, it's like grabbing air. When we perceive that, when we start to understand that everything is th that, that process, that life, that opens the Honzon, right? The great venerable Aha Buddha. When you start to understand this, you can start to then understand that all of the constructions of the universe, right? From Big Bang to Big What? A lot of theories about that. But everything in between, it's all this experience, this being. None of it, beginning or end, exists. It just manifests from point to point, moment to moment, and expresses potential. But Sylvain, Sifu, how can we say the earth is so many billion years old and has this history of being and say it doesn't exist? It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that in and of itself, the earth has been instantiating its potential for that long. And that potential, that process, continues. But it won't continue forever. Because at any one moment, whatever it's instantiating, whatever it's manifesting, is gone. To the next moment, to the next moment. And we're riding on top of it. Why do I say all of this? Because this is the breakdown that 3,000 realms in a single thought moment is exactly about. Is that at any given moment, all potential forms of energy, forms of being are at the ready. They need only to be manifest. 
more personally, that means, and this is what we focus on usually in our practice, yes, is our local experience and how to live life more fully, more positively, more life affirmingly, less stress, less, right? This is Buddhism. But it's easy to forget that that same logic applies to all of reality, all of the universe or the universes, however you choose to understand that. And that is your life, my life, the life of the universe, there's no difference. There is an arising, there is uh, an evolution and decay, and there is a dissolution. Everything works that way. Oh, crap. Well, I had tissues. I guess I have no more. <sighs> Having nose karma. <laughs> So, why do I say all this? It sounds convoluted, I know. Apologies. The point is, what Nietzsche has introduced in his conversation, his letter to his uh, Tendai friend, who's now uh, been converted to, uh, actually, in a way, converted back to the Tendai roots, Chi'i's roots, of the 3,000 moments, 3,000 realms in a single thought moment, um, and the idea of, as I started this video, what is life? What is Buddhahood? Those answers come from a recognition of, an immersion into, an acceptance that life isn't the material things of the universe. It's the process, and furthermore, it's not just the process, it's the mind that perceives it. That's where life is happening, in the mind. No matter how simple the mind, or convoluted and complex the mind, without perception, there's no life. Consequently, everything that's perceived in truth is a construct of that mind, of that perception. Without the mind, it ain't happening. Not for you, not for me. Maybe somebody else, but that's their life? At what scale do we stop to refer to one another as separate experiences of life before we come to understand that en masse, all experience of life is the stuff of life? that the universe is not separate or distinct or many, 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 many parts of life, but completely embraced and held within the moment-to-moment -moment experience of it, life. Now, the next time you say, that's life. Understand what you're saying. That the cup of coffee that I'm drinking, the ground that I walk on, the thoughts going through my head are the universe itself. And they're the same for you and for her and for them. 
this perception that I'm talking about, that's Buddha. I mean, down to the core, not just words we say, but the actual enlightenment, the awakening to knowing that in every nanosecond of our perceptive experience. If you begin to understand that, then it's obvious that all phenomena are enlightenment. Because the very fact that they are phenomena are only through our distinguishing, made up another word. When we identify, we are slicing the same pie. Right? No matter how thin a sliver of the carrot cake you can make, the sliver is carrot cake. The carrot cake is carrot cake. It's all carrot cake. Just because you cut a sliver of carrot cake, put it in a plate and eat it, does not mean that your sliver is unique. It's all carrot cake. The uniqueness is our delusion. The uniqueness is identifying mine, not yours. My experience, not yours. But that's just avarice. That's just a greedy hanging on to identification. This is at the core of Buddhism. And it's not easy. You don't want to, somebody says, hey, what's Buddhism? And you go, well, <laughs> and you say all of this. Do you not think that they're just going to tilt their heads and look at you and go, so, you like rubber rooms? <laughs> yeah. Right? It takes time to gain the perspective, the, the mental fabric to conceptualize this. This is what Shakyamuni was dealing with 3,000 years ago when he started teaching how that appears in the mind that realization, he got a bunch of his disciples, I think there were five left at that point, just, okay, what? <laughs> they couldn't get it. That's why he didn't teach the Avatamsaka Sutra, his first sermon, whether you know that as Kigan or Flower Garland or Avatamsaka, the... Notice he returns to the flower, by the way, with the Lotus Sutra. But he only tried to teach that for a couple of weeks. Eh, accounts differ two weeks, three weeks. I've even read in uh, Nietzsche and Shu, they, they, they say six weeks. Whatever. It was a short period of time before he realized, oh, these people are not prepared. They don't understand what the hell I'm talking about. I must sound like whatever and so he backed off and you know the story right teaching and levels cultivating understanding and we get to the lotus sutra so as we continue this letter the shoho chiso sho which nichiren began with the treatise on all phenomena as ultimate reality which is would be the English and English translation of the Shoho Jiso Sho. Meaning of all phenomena as ultimate reality, because ultimate reality is that all phenomena are really one phenomena. Myoho Denge Kyo. Ah, the key. All phenomena are really one phenomena expressed in innumerable, uncountable ways. Manifestation of this one phenomena. 
this energetic momentum with one, one and only desire, volition, force to be from that everything that is is simply an expression of to be every manifestation in the entirety of the universe is a resulting moment a manifestation an instantiation of the massive collection and constantly growing conception or conceptions of potential. If I can do this, I can do these things. If I can do these things, I can do these things. This is the universe. This is life. And what a unique, tiny sliver we are of that immense process that we alone have emerged the capacity to witness it. Because without witnessing it, observing it, grappling with it in mind, who would know? Would it just go on its merry way and then fizzle out and without a witness, did it happen? If a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears or sees it, has a tree fallen in the woods? I mean, we grapple with this constantly in poetry and everywhere. But we seldom take the time to realize what we're really experiencing. So in this next part where he talks about Bodhisattva disciples of the original Buddha, what do you think the original Buddha is? We still constantly are talking about this process. And the only place where you can perceive and witness this protest, pr protest, process, is the mind. This is why you hear me constantly saying, Buddhism is about the mind. If our attitudes, our mind, is centered around specific phenomena, attached to, identified to, collecting, not losing, discarding phenomena, then we are samsaric. Like having a cold. But when we can break our mind free of that congestion of that local obsessions of identifications and we can perceive our mind of the whole process, that's when we truly live. That's when we live a largesse that we would never conceive of in our local mind right of me 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 if we think a witness of life we suddenly explode our perceiving mind into a much more immense stage right and that stage that immensity that it's never changed. It's always been the same process. Yes, it's manifesting countless variations, but the process is the same. And perceiving that process, that's, that's Buddha. And that perception 
can only happen in one place. Right? In the mind, in the witness. But that doesn't mean it wasn't there before the witness. It has been part and parcel, pardon the pun, of the process since it began. Without time, timelessness, yeah? Without beginning or end, this verbiage we use all the time, that's what it means. So when we talk about original Buddha, we're talking about our local <laughs> our local all kinds of noises happening on the roof and everywhere else. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's somewhat distracting, right? Squirrel. Anyway, so I've just proven to you I'm human <laughs> because distraction. So original Buddha simply means not that there was a point in time when there was somebody who was enlightened. That's not, again, this points to the fact that Buddha is simply what we label because we're, we don't know how to communicate without labels, identifying that this process is without time and that our perception of it our awakening to it is actually what we call Buddha. Or, if you like, Buddha-ing. We're Buddha-ing. And how do we Buddha when we want to be Buddha-ing? We call it out. Buddha-ing. Myoho renge kyo. I namu Buddha-ing. Myoho renge kyo. There is no one but I, Nichiren, who advocated such doctrines. Tendai, Myalo, Dengyo, they realized these truths, but they didn't voice them. People weren't, still weren't ready to get it. They kept them deep in their minds, in their minds, because they had not received the transmission of the Dharma from the Buddha, Time had not matured yet, and they did not ha uh, they had not been disciples of the original Buddha. That's confusing. I think what that means is because for all of us, this practice is an awakening to something that's always existed, but even in the earlier pre Lotus Sutra teachings, the idea of enlightenment was very local. In other words, I am enlightened rather than, and it's a subtle difference, but it's a very meaningful difference. I am not enlightened. You are not enlightened. We can be locally, is the word I've, I've been using late of late, yes? Locally, this manifestation that I identify as me can perceive the whole. I can awaken, look through, peer, expand my mind to witness the entirety. That Buddha, that enlightenment is the Lotus Sutra. That's what we're talking about. So when he says they had not been disciples of the original Buddha, what he's in fact saying is that their practice, their understanding of Buddhism was still limited to their own experience. And you could say, Sifu, of course. You have to get the difference here. Yes, you can experience it locally. Of course you can experience it locally. But at one point, at some point, your earthly mind must let go of that personalized, identificated 
experience and come to understand that your local experience is the limitation of the experience. And the experience is not limited. It's the entirety of all the universe, the entire process. And that when you self-realize Buddha, the self is simply a vantage point. It's not a thing. It would be like, I understand swimming because I jump in the water and I swim. And instead, I jump in the water and I become the water. Yeah. Basically, all of this is wrapping words around the idea that the time was still not right for the minds of people to grasp this, to easily do this. Some could, but very few. Except for bodhisattvas such as superior practice and limitless practice, right? The four leaders of the bodhisattvas, the bodhisattvas that Nichiren himself identifies with. Problematic word there. Highest ranking leaders of the bodhisattvas who emerged from the earth, people like us, who came 3,000 years after the extinction of Shakyamuni. No one is allowed to appear in the 500 year period at the beginning of the latter age of degeneration and to spread the five characters, not letters, of Myoho Renge Kyo, of this expansive being Buddha, awareness of, experience of Buddha, universally. Which is the substance of all existing things. Because there's existing. What does that mean? Existing by imprint on the mind, which is constantly changing, evolving, reinstantiating, moment to moment. Furthermore, no one else can form the most venerable one with the two Buddhas, Shakyamuni and many treasures, seated side by side in the stupa of treasures. The mandala is a picture that Nichiren has created to exemplify this complete enlightenment. This Myoho Renge Kyo. This is because the Daimoku and Hanzon are the gist of the quote, actual 3,000 existences contained in one thought moment. That existences, realms. That doctrine expounded in the lifespan chapter of the lifespan of the Tathagata chapter of the Lotus Sutra in the essentials of the Lotus Sutra. And it should be spread by Bodhisattva disciples of the original Buddha. In other words, only with that perceptive understanding of Buddhaness can the Lotus Sutra be taught adequately, be shared adequately, be experienced fully. And this is our time. We are the ones capable of doing that. He starts now, he, he's jumping through these concepts because there's an assumed knowledge with his Tendai monk disciple. He knows he's, he's spent his whole life studying these concepts and Nichiren is stitching them together, right? All phenomena as ultimate reality in the Lotus Sutra. Therefore, the two Buddhas, Shakyamuni and many treasures, are functions of the substance that is the five characters of Myoho Renge Kyo. Now here it says characters instead of letters. Who's... <laughs> 
This translation is maddening. In other words, the Lotus Sutra is the original Buddha. So the very scholarship, the very sermon, the very, the objective, the substance, and the actualization of this sermon of the Lotus Sutra is itself a description, a, a, a manual, a method for awakening this grandiose situation, this life without time or space. Because if you just look at the word life, it doesn't have a span, does it? Isn't that interesting? When we talk about life, do we think of a beginning or end? You might, well, death, but death, death isn't the opposite of life. It's the flip side of birth. Right? Start, finish, start, finish, start, finish. But the finish is provisional because it leads to another start. Birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. Death is not the opposite of life. Death, death is a marker on the process of life and just indicates a transitory moment. People get confused by this. Non-Buddhists get confused by this. Life has no timescape. Life is just, well, you could say life is time. Because time is an illusion. Time is a measurement. Life is not. Life is an experience. Life is an observation of the process. Gosh, that's amazing. So Buddhahood is the consciousness of life. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Look, this is profound stuff. And I know that you're up to the task. But this is one of those moments when Nitrin would caution his interlocutor to say, look, you and I understand this because we've been studying this a long time, but don't just share it indiscriminately because people's confusion about what we're talking about could have really negative reactions negative reactions, not because we need to guard ourselves from people calling us nuts, but because their misunderstanding will lead them away from their own enlightenment. And we can't plant that that way. Yeah. So let's go on. The lifespan of the Tathagatha chapter of the Lotus Sutra mentions the Buddha's Quote, hidden core and divine powers. Again, translation, right? The hidden core of the world honored one refers to the substance of the original Buddha processing the threefold body. This is the process of the entire universe. The Dharma body, the reward body, and accommodative body. Right? The instantiations, the manifestations, the engine that creates the space and the time which is itself the accommodative body, the manifest body, the accommodative body being the one that in the manifest body leads you back to perceiving from which the process is that we instantiate, which itself is the Dharma body. Now we're assigning physical terms to it, but it's just a transitory identification, dissection of the process. These amazing processes, powers, 
mean that the three bodies of a manifested Buddha is as functions of the original Buddha, the substance. Hmm. The process, I would say. Also, we unenlightened people can fundamentally be the original Buddha with the three bodies of substance, and the Buddha's three bodies are functions and manifestations of the original Buddha. This is what I just described, yeah? If this is true, although we believe that Shakyamuni Buddha provided the three virtues of master, teacher, and, and uh, parent to us, instead it was we unenlightened people who provided three virtues to the Buddha. Thank you! It's all about perception. The reason why we say this is based on Tendai's interpretation in the ninth facile of the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra that, quote, the Tathagata, the thus come one, the manifestation, is a common term for all Buddhas in the ten directions in the past, present, and future. Two Buddhas, true body and accommodative body. Three Buddhas, Dharma body, reward body, and accommodative body. The original Buddha and Buddhas in manifestation, end quote. In this annotation, the original Buddha refers to the unenlightened people and the Buddhas in manifestation mean Buddhas. However, there's a difference between unenlightened people and enlightened Buddhas and those people are unaware that both people and Buddhas originally possess the same threefold bodies, either as substance or function. What is a function? The universe is a function. It's a function of energy amalgamating to express whatever. Everything, nothing. And we become observers of that function. As observers of that function, we manifest three aspects of that function. The function, the apparatus by which to perceive the function, and the perception. The three bodies of Buddha. It's not mystical. It's just language. Words get in the way. Tendai, therefore, makes it clear that all things and phenomena in the ten realms are manifestations of the ultimate reality, the function. Since ultimate reality is another name of the Lotus Sutra, because we like naming things, what he states is that all things and phenomena are equal to the Lotus Sutra. In other words, what is taught in the Lotus Sutra is the Dharma. It's the function. It's how to tap into that function. It is a reality of a hell showing hell's appearance. Observation. If its appearance turns into that of the realm of hungry spirits, it is no longer a hell. All phenomena as ultimate reality means that the Buddhas show Buddhas. Appearance, unenlightened people show their appearance, and the true appearance of all things is the truth of the Lotus Sutra. Remember the ten factors? They're ways of discernment. Tendai also explains, quote, the profound doctrine of all phenomena as ultimate reality is the Lotus Sutra that exists originally and always. Because the Sermon of the Lotus Sutra is the actual method of realizing this singular truth. The one vehicle. This annotation means that the deep doctrine of the ultimate reality expounded in the theoretical teaching of the Lotus Sutra is called 
in the essential section of the Lotus, uh, Sutra of the Lotus Flower of the Wonderful Dharma, which exists originally and always. This interpretation is not easy to understand, so please spare no effort in contemplating this. And on that note, we'll start the next video. Okay, now this, I realize, and I chose this, um, this Go Show, because of its profound insight into our practice. Having said that, I'm sure some of you have questions. Appropriately so. This is a very This letter, as I've already said, has an assumed knowledge base, but that knowledge base is of monks who've spent their lifetimes researching and trying to understand all of the concepts. And sometimes when you look at something from the standpoint of every screw and nut and washer and piece and part that it's made of, although you can gain great amounts of insight it's very easy and even endemic that you lose sight of the entirety. What's the point? What's this all, all of this information? What is this helping me see? What is this helping me understand? And, uh, you know, I don't know that other than dogged determination, chanting every day, doing gang-yo, studying a little bit. I think for some, this comes together very quickly. And for most, probably, it takes time. It takes the slow building of these concepts to open one's own eyes of experience, to one's own experience of life, to start to see broadly the implications throughout, not locally, but broadly. We all start locally. Well, I shouldn't say that. Some of us may start with the grand design in mind. But even then, I think it's our, it's the way we're instantiated. We're local, we're identifiers. So everything's about centered here, yes, local. At some point though, you're gonna break through that and you're going to start seeing that this local is an illusion, that this local is simply water within an ocean. And this discussion is about the ocean, perceived locally, but not as an alternate, as part and parcel. And that makes this discussion full of tripwires, but it's also full of insights, amazing insights. So perhaps I'm going through it too quickly, But I'm also confident that many of you have come to Buddhism more than once. And you've had your epiphanies and many insights. And putting it together this way, as a, I, I resist saying high level dialogue, but in, in high level, I only mean a great deal of experience and insights, which many of us have, right? I know many of you do. This kind of coalesces all of those ideas under one kind of umbrella of understanding. It can be tremendously a springboard for your Buddhahood, yeah? I hope that it is. I hope that it very, at very least, that it 
it points to some areas that you still find confounding or difficult to to hold on to in your mind that that that, that maybe there's um i don't know some kind of confusion or or difficulty to understand please use the comments let us know what that is so we can dissect this thing because there's a lot in here and uh if suddenly a bubble has burst and suddenly you realize much more congratulations that's why we study thank you for being here thank you don't forget to like subscribe right share be careful <laughs> take care of your health be kind to yourself and um, i will see you soon because we need to get through this this uh this go show there's a lot in here and uh Personally, I find all of you guys amazing because the kind of insights that these these letters have, this this teaching, this this Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni's insight, so so profound. Namo Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, bye for now.